This talk is part of a series presented by the Techade AI for Good conference and hackathon. Our goal with this virtual event is to highlight technological innovation driven by artificial intelligence and directed towards beneficial areas such as health, environment, accessibility, and human rights. Importantly, we also aim to raise money for Centraide or the United Way, a nonprofit dedicated to fighting poverty and social exclusion. And this is where you can help. Please consider donating by clicking the link in the description of this video. Any amount will be greatly appreciated. Also, if you're watching this before November 12, 2020, consider registering to our event for a chance to ask questions and interact with our speakers. This event would not have been possible without the help of our sponsors, such as DeepMind, Ubisoft, Ivado, and Dell Technologies. We thank them for their generous support. Please visit our website for a full list of sponsors and partners. Finally, I'd like to give a special shout out to our, one of our sponsors, Ubisoft. For those of you who don't know yet, Ubisoft La Forge is a collaborative space created by Yves Jacquier. At Ubisoft Montréal, they bring together experts from their studio and from the academic sector to accelerate research and development through prototyping, complementing academic learnings with, while testing the potential benefits of technological innovations in virtual worlds and filling the gap between theory and practice. I invite you to visit their website, laforge.ubisoft.com, where you will find articles from the researchers and videos showing their prototypes. With that, I'll leave you to enjoy our featured presentation. Bonjour, uh, good morning, and ça me fait plaisir d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Um, I'm going to share with you a talk entitled Building Reproducible, Reusable, and Robust Deep Reinforcement Learning System, which comes out of work that we've done at uh, McGill University uh, over the last few years. And so my research expertise really is in reinforcement learning systems, both more theoretical and applied. And over the last few years, I've become very interested in um, determining how we can make sure that the systems we build are actually robust and perform as expected. And so I will share with you some of our findings and hopefully this will be interesting for anyone in who's committed to building solid reinforcement learning system. For those of you who might be a little bit less familiar with the reinforcement learning or RL framework, uh, allow me to say a few words of introduction. We are assuming that we're building a machine learning system, so an intelligent agent, that core of intelligent we're gonna capture with the agent over here. That agent has the ability to take actions in the world. And so these actions have an impact in the world, they change the world somehow. Um, which elicits a, a response. And so that response is both in the form of observations um, or states, and also in the form of a reward, an indicator saying whether the choice of action in a particular state was good or bad. And this loop keeps on going until the agent sort of meets the end of a particular trajectory. And so when you look at the very general setting, actually this can be used where the environment is unknown, where it's nonlinear, where there's a lot of complexity to it, the state can be um, gotten from sensor information, very rich perception, and so on. And so really the goal is to maximize reward over the lifetime or the trajectory of the agent. And so as you can imagine, this is both a mathematical framework, but also something that we can transform into a computational framework to control whether it's robots or many other intelligent agents to deploy in the world. And indeed, we have seen very impressive success with reinforcement learning systems in game in the last few years, including building systems such as AlphaGo, such as Libratus, which were designed to play the game of Go on the one hand, or the game of poker really at a level exceeding some of the best human players. So that's been very impressive just coming in the last few years. Um, and one of the things that put reinforcement and learning really on the map as a powerful method for machine learning. That being said, games are not the only applications. And if you dig into the literature and you pay attention, you'll actually notice applications of reinforcement learning in a wide number of different application domains. I'm listing just a few over here to give you an idea. Um, but there's really many, many more um, that are possible. And in the sense, you can think of the space of possible applications as being anywhere you might want to bring in an intelligent system that's not making only predictions, but it's actually taking decisions, carrying out actions, and learning through trial and error and this reward function, which actions are good to apply in what states and which actions to avoid in what state. 
So at the end of all this, the system is able to evolve a policy, a strategy for when to apply which action in which situation. And so that's very, very general concept. Um, what matters is defining the right level of information into the system. For each of these applications, someone has to determine what is the information we're going to capture in the state? What's the right reward function? What are we trying to optimize? And what's the set of actions that the agent can play with? In some of our own projects um, at uh, McGill University over the last few years, we've looked at applying reinforcement learning specifically for the problem of adaptive neurostimulation. So in that case, a stimulation device is actually um, developed with the purpose of applying electrical current to the brain of a patient with uh, epilepsy. And the, the hypothesis is that if you are careful about where, when, and how you apply this electrical current, you can actually disturb the synchronization in the neurons in the brain and force the brain essentially to break out of the mode that leads to, to epileptic seizures. And so in partnership with researchers at the Montreal Neurological Institute, we've investigated ways to use reinforcement learning to automatically learn the right patterns of stimulation directly from data. In this case, the work was done with animal models. And so we had a little bit more flexibility in terms of exploring different courses of actions to see whether we could effectively reduce the amount of seizures we observed. Um, but also minimize as much as possible the use of stimulation because it can have a long-term damaging effect on the tissue. <coughs> and so through this work, we actually had um, an opportunity to explore a completely new application of reinforcement learning, which really forced us to ask a lot of questions about the, the, the integrity and the, the performance of our, of our system because certainly we wanted to, to perform well. We didn't want to um, cause any harm. And we wanted to make sure that the system we were going to deploy was very robust so that we had learned it well. One of the challenges in carrying out such a project is the fact that most of the work that's done in reinforcement learning in the literature that where we can learn from is actually done in simulation. And so usually on games, whether it's the game of Go or whether it's Atari games or other simulated environment, the advantage there is you get a lot of data very fast and for very low cost. When you're thinking of applying reinforcement learning in the real world, the availability of data is typically much, much less. And so you have to learn much faster from small amounts of data. The data can be expensive to compute. It can be difficult to record. And so there's really a gap between, you know, the findings we have in the literature based on simulation experiments versus what we are trying to do in, in our practical work. And sometimes that difference in the settings is causing a lot of difficulty in knowing which of the results from the literature will in fact transfer well to the practical settings. And so let me share with you just a brief snapshot of you know, the size of the literature and reinforcement learning over the last um, 30 years or so. <clears throat> the, the, the first few papers started appearing around the very late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, but over the last few years, we've seen a really steady growth in the number of papers on this topic that are published in the, in the scientific community. And so for anyone wanting to take on a new application, really, you have to consider that whole space of literature and try to figure out which of all of these papers has perhaps the useful recipe for the problem you're trying to solve. And that is getting harder and harder every year. Um, and so it becomes very important that we understand how the experiments in those papers are done, how they might translate to the real world, and also um, how, to, how to read the experimental results provided in this, in this literature. And so a few years ago, we actually looked in a very systematic way at the literature, trying to pick out which of the results we thought were more reliable than others um, and could be perhaps the clue to, to solving some of our practical problems. Most of the algorithms we looked at, and what I'm gonna do for the next few minutes is sort of take you on this journey that we did of, of uh, figuring out how to analyze the literature, how to understand what results might be useful. And so most of the algorithms we considered were in a specific class of reinforcement learning techniques, which we call policy gradient algorithms. 
So the nice thing about this class of algorithm is it's actually really taking into account some of the latest work on deep learning, neural networks, and so on, taking advantage of that for reinforcement learning. And so it's a relatively simple setup. You have a state, um, which is the information about the real world. In the case of our epilepsy um, neurostimulation device, the state is actually EEG readings that are recorded in real time from electrodes implanted in the brain. So you get that state information, you pass it through a neural network. The particular architecture of that neural network depends a bit on what type of application you're interested in and whether you're, you, the type of uh, state information you're feeding in. So you pass it through this neural network and the prediction of that neural network is to predict the probability of using different actions. And so that then you can just maximize over that and pick the, the function that you think is most appropriate. And so there's many different um, flavors from this particular uh, family of algorithms. I'm listing four of them there, but there's many, many more in the literature. And those four are the ones that we're going to sort of follow in this, in this talk today. Um, so between these algorithms, you know, there's different claims as to which might perform well or less well in different settings. And so we started digging in um, and, and looking at in fact, the, the, the fact that there's a lot of different types of variation that come into play for any of them. We sometimes call them hyperparameter. So these are properties of the learner that you have to specify in order to run the algorithm. And so with all the sources of experimental var variation, it becomes difficult to know which method to apply in what kind of a setting. Um, and so this is really what led us to this work on, on reproducibility, um, reusability and robustness. And, and, and the connective thread between these three concepts is really the following. The, the idea of reproducibility is, is directly linked to the ability of a researcher to duplicate the results of a prior study using the same materials information as uh, the original investigator. And reproducibility is important because it's essentially the minimum necessary condition for a finding to be believable and informative. And so as we have many sources of variations, which I've listed on the slide before, it may become harder to have strong reproducibility because you may not have all the information you need in terms of, um, of the experiments. And so indeed, when we started looking into this, you know, here are some of the findings that we had. Um, this is a simple domain. We were looking at the literature, so we used the domains that were taken. This is a result from, uh, a task from the Mojoko simulator, this is what we call the half cheetah task. So it's essentially like a very simplified version of a cheetah uh, learning to run around. So the video I'm showing you here is after it has learned. If you see it before, it's kind of lying on its back, flanneling around, not doing very much. Um, and if we compare the four algorithms I listed earlier in terms of their performance on this cheetah domain, we see that algorithm one performs better than the others. There's quite some variance um, between that algorithm. Some of them have lower variance, but less good performance. And so on the basis of that, one might conclude that algorithm number one, and the specific one doesn't really matter, um, but that algorithm number one performs better than the, than the, than the three others considered. Now, you know, the half cheetah is one sort of <laughs> case in this Mojoko simulator, which offers a few different cases. There's another one that's a hopper where you have a little agent that learns to kind of hop around the environment. You have a swimmer that learns to, to swim. And if you apply the same four algorithms to these other two environments, all within the same simulator, so the same way to simulate the dynamics, you get very different results. So in the hopper environment, the blue algorithm seems to do best. The red is actually at the bottom here. If you go to the swimmer environment, the blue performs the best. Um, the red doesn't seem to learn at all, but the blue has a very large margin um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of different performances. So suggesting it's not very stable. Sometimes it learns, sometimes it doesn't. Now these results are a bit puzzling because those three environments are actually quite similar. Certainly amongst themselves, they're much more similar than any of them compared to our neurostimulation application. So knowing what to do, what to conclude, what algorithm to consider becomes very difficult. Um, in most of these cases we had used to do this, this comparison, 
we had used code bases drawn from publicly opened libraries, so open source software here, rather than implementing our own. The goal was really to mimic the process of taking something from the literature and trying to apply it and seeing if the results are robust. So we thought maybe the first version of each code base we considered wasn't uh, reliable, maybe there were some bugs in implementation, some difficulty in running it. So we went and considered a few different code bases. TRPO is you know, a very well-cited um, uh, algorithm. There's a lot of implementation publicly available on GitHub. So we went and grabbed a few others. And indeed, we found a lot of differences in the results between each of them, though it's, I assume, implementing the same algorithm from the same paper. Um, it's not just TRPO, DDPG, which is another one of the algorithm considered, similarly has quite a bit of variance between different implementations, all of them publicly available. Um, so it's difficult to know based on that which of these results to retain. And, and as we dug in more and more on this, you know, we started trying out these different factors of variation, you know, the list of different hyperparameters I presented earlier. We played with the policy network structure. So that box, the neural net box that goes in the, in the policy gradient algorithm, we changed that a bit. We looked at different activation functions that are popular in the literature and in all cases, we saw surprisingly large differences in the results when we started varying this. And so that makes it very hard to compare from one algorithm to the next. Um, we also looked at the scaling of a reward, whether to or not to apply um, layer-wise normalization. And, and one of the challenges of all of this is really the fact that when you're comparing one algorithm versus another, unless you have extensive data and computation, it becomes very hard to search through the whole space of possible hyperparameter. And furthermore, as I mentioned very beginning of the talk, you know, when you're doing real world application, you don't have all that much data. It's not like you can run a simulator and rerun the experiment dozens and dozens, not millions of times to figure out the right configuration of the hyperparameter. So it becomes very important to be able to rely on a given configuration that's been optimized in other spaces in order to make those decisions. So it seems easy to think, well, if I want to compare two algorithms, I can give the same amount of data, same amount of computation, and voila, things are done. Um, but because these different algorithms have a different set of hyperparameters or configurations parameters, it becomes difficult to do. And what we observed in, in, our, in our investigation is really just that fact, the fact that you know, it, was, it was difficult to do a reliable evaluation between these different methods. Um, let's, let me share with you one last case, which we did. Over time, as we were doing this, we started controlling more and more and narrowing down the set of you know, the, the factors uh, that could uh, affect the variance in the results. And the students I was working with one day, they, they showed up in my office and they present this graph and you know, essentially saying, hey, we've, we have a very interesting results. We've controlled the amount of data between these two methods. We really think it's a fair comparison. There's like a nice separation between both of these. Each of these lines is averaged over five different experiments. So we've reduced the, the error on the, on the results. And I asked them, great, you know, what are those two methods? They said, well, here's the thing. These are actually both exactly the same code base with the same hyperparameter configuration. And the only thing that changed is the random seed between the two sets of experiments. That's a little bit problematic because you shouldn't be seeing such a separation between, between these two cases. Um, and so as we started thinking about that, you know, we had a lot of discussions about how are we measuring performance? What does it mean to have this notion of standard error and significance in the difference between the results? Um, in, in many cases, the, the results that we are seeing, you know, we have this, this band around the result line. This is really the confidence interval. And, and we make a you know, simplifying assumption that the distribution of our results is Gaussian and we apply the appropriate confidence interval. And, and really the only factor is the number of experiments we're gonna run. And in our case, that corresponds also to the number of random seeds we consider. 
And so there's a question, how many is enough? How many of these experiments do I need to know to have high confidence in my results? This is this, this parameter N that shows up over here. And so we went into the literature and said, you know, because you know, the, the, like most of the experiments we did was with five, uh, five seeds, thinking that was enough. And that was based on the literature. We were sort of following the recipe provided by researchers over the years. Um, and we found something a little bit unusual here. The number of trials indeed were at most five for the most part. There was one case that went up to nine in, in some experiment, but mostly two, three, five. There was a few of them that were using a very funny method where they would report the top two, three, or five, but might have done more trials. So they were reporting just the, the top band. And that uh, intrigued me, <laughs> to put it, <laughs> a positive spin on something that actually worries me quite a bit, um, that, uh, that they were doing this. And, and he, let me explain to you in, in a very visual way why, why that worries me, to only report the you know, the top two, three, or five experiments. Let's say you've run 10 experiments, and, and this is roughly the distribution of all these experiments, and then you're trying to beat some kind of other method, we'll call it the baseline. Whenever your results are above it, you think you've found a new, better algorithm. Whenever they're below, you feel like, well, whatever's in the literature before was better. If you take just your top three results out of this, what you find is this. So, First, there's definitely a strong positive bias. So you're being very optimistic in presenting the results compared to the full distribution. And secondly, the variance actually appears much smaller than it is before. And so through this, you can get some of these very weird, weird results such as, such as I showed you earlier, where you have kind of this nice separation, but really it's just the random seed that changes. And so this method was sort of getting um, reasonably widespread in the in the literature um, and, and definitely not a trend to, to encourage if you really want to have a, a good characterization of the results. And so this, you know, our, our noticing of that has prompted all sorts of <laughs> rather alarmist uh, headlines, you know, reinforcement learning never worked or reinforcement learning's foundational flaws and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think these are more alarmist than, than need be, um, but I think what you really need is to pay very careful attention to your methodology, to how the results are done, and um, not seek a positive results as much as seek to really carefully understand the characteristics of a particular approach. And so really, you know, this was a, a moment of, you know, we don't, we don't want to despair, but at the same time, it's clearly a call for action to do better in terms of uh, empirical methods. And, and the reason I don't emphasize which algorithm, you know, was characterized in this way or another is because I think the, the, the poor experimentation is actually something that afflicts many, many work across the field and it's hard to be very rigorous in doing so. So I'm both, you know, um, really asking the community to pay much more attention to how they report their results. I'm asking people who engage in experimentation to do so um, really understanding the, the tools that they have. And, and I'm asking the people who sort of consume the scientific literature to really understand what is being presented and know which questions to ask. That's really my motivation in, in pursuing this work. And so, you know, it's not sufficient to just think about having the same amount of data, same amount of compute to have fair comparisons. We have to acknowledge that different methods are going to have different sets of hyperparameters, different sensitivity to them, maybe different require different budget in order to seek um, robust conclusions. Um, it, it's not enough necessarily to do that. And so in trying to improve the field, I actually started looking more broadly at other fields who have had to, to deal with, you know, coming up with very, very robust procedures and robust methods and Looking on the one hand towards like aviation, you know, we, we fly, we used to, and in this time of pandemic, it's a, it's a little bit more difficult, but we used to fly, you know, thousands and thousands of planes every day. Most of them reach their destination without bad occurrence. And, and similarly on the, the surgical side, um, a lot of, you know, methods have been put in place to rigorously ensure that um, we, we are able to, to, to operate in a, in a safe and reliable way. And one of the tools these two fields have in common, actually, that has 
been shown um, rigorously to improve uh, the quality of outcomes is a simple checklist. Um, and, and the use of a checklist in both of these settings has become standard. Um, and we've measured the effect of using this, this, these checklists in terms of improving reliability and safety. And so from that um, evolved the idea of having a checklist for machine learning also, um, the way we call the ML reproducibility checklist. It has evolved a little bit over the last uh, year and a half, um, but this is actually a checklist that's very practical for anyone who engages in machine learning to do. Um, even if you're not seeking to publish a paper just in terms of having an internal report or a characterization of your approach, this gives you a pretty comprehensive list of what you should try to include. So some, you know, there's some criteria in terms of the models and the algorithms that you're using. There's a particular criteria if you make a theoretical claim, which may be less relevant for people who are really on the application side. For the data sets that you're using, there's a set of criteria that we propose to consider to make sure that you have um, documented the appropriate information. More recently, we've added a few more items in terms of the code. And if you were going to share any of that code in an open source uh, way, here are some of the things we would expect to see to improve reliability of, uh, of the work. And finally, for the experimental results, which is mostly what I focused on today, there's sort of a set of different uh, criteria that we recommend including when you report on the experimental results. I believe this checklist can be used externally, but it can also be used internally within a team um, when it's a case of like sharing results within the team. Over the last uh, couple of years, the checklist has become now standard uh, for papers submitted at some of the largest uh, international conferences, such as NeurIPS, ICML, and a few others, um, really as a guide to help the, the authors make sure that they're including all the necessary component um, when describing their work. And so it's been an interesting journey to, to come from sort of noticing a problem in the community, thinking really carefully about what were the characteristics of that problem and coming up with, with um, now some tools that the community can adopt. It seems very, very low tech in terms of tools. Um, we are looking to automate the ability to check some of these things, um, but it will still be pretty low key tooling and in many ways, the purpose of the checklist is really for people who are researchers and practitioners of machine learning to deeply engage with the quality of the work that they do. Um, and this checklist serves as a guide for, for doing that, that work. Um, as I'm wrapping up uh, my talk today, let me just really remind you um, that um, as we, we engage in this type of work, I think it's important to remember that science is really a collective institution. Sometimes, you know, it feels very much like a competitive sport, but I think my message today is really to remind us that this, this collective work we, we do together is really um, aimed at understanding and explaining phenomenon. And, and we have to keep really that focus and that perspective on when we do our experimental work. Um, Finally, you know, I, 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 it's a pleasure for me to share these, these uh, results with you, but I want to acknowledge the fact that there's many, many researchers who've contributed to this, both researchers at uh, Milan, at McGill, my academic research home, as well as in Facebook AI Research Lab in Montreal, my industrial uh, research home. I've been nourished by the ideas of all of these fantastic people, so I want to, uh, to acknowledge and thank them. And I want to thank you for your attention today. As a final step, I want to remind you that this talk is, um, is done in the context of a TechAid event. So I do encourage you to um, donate to, to TechAid and help uh, Centraide, the United Way, really support the work that they do in our community. Thank you very much.